So it wouldn't be fair not to start with some joke. I heard a lot of you heard this this morning, so I'll make it even longer. <laughs> so a Muslim goes to heaven, and he says, God, God, I'm really worried. My son is converting to Christianity. And God said, I had that same problem. <laughs> but most of you heard that already today. So I have a really uh, easy chore. Once again, I get to introduce somebody who's by far more, better known than I am and whose resume. I'm raising you up. Oh. Whose resume puts my pitiful one to shame. Susan Desmond Hellman, there are a lot of things on her resume that are unbelievable. There are some things that aren't on there that are equally unbelievable. She is a phenomenal athlete, runner, cyclist, skier, all three areas in which I could not hope to compete. But there are, she's not perfect. In the first place, she spells her name wrong. <laughs> and we've been working on that for months now, my sister and I, and it, it just isn't taking. Secondly, it can't be real. Nobody has a resume that approximates this. And so, you know, I, I mean, there's some possibility that, that she just doesn't exist. But let me just run through a few of the high points that I picked out. Previously, she was president of product development at Genentech. She became an MD at UCSF, associate director of clinical research at Bristol-Myers, was project team leader for the cancer drug Taxol. Previously, an associate adjunct professor at UCSF, on the board of the Federal Reserve Bank Board of San Francisco, the top Biotech Hall of Fame, Fortune's has been one and continues to be one of Fortune's 50 most powerful women in the United States. And now, thank God, she is the chancellor of UCSF, badly needed and already tearing the place apart. So Susan, if you'll just correct the spelling, we'll be, we'll be bosom buddies. Thank you, Warren, for that lovely introduction. A, a, a few uh, years ago, I, I gave a talk down at Google for their uh, um, a, a Google conference, and I was speaking, and I'm not kidding you, this is a true story, I found myself speaking in between Al Gore and Bill Clinton. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that is my worst nightmare, speaking in between Al Gore and Bill Clinton. And, and actually, I was wrong. That wasn't my worst nightmare. My worst nightmare is trying to follow Sissy Swig's <laughs> remarks. <laughs> I, I, I was sitting memorizing everything you were saying with the hopes that I could quote you in the future because that was such a lovely speech. So congratulations. I can see why you're receiving such well-deserved recognition. Um, I. I was told earlier by John Prisker that I was going to be talking science to a group of, of tax accountants, and I'm sure you're wrong. I, I, I am sure that many of you love science as much as I do. Um, but, but I did pick a topic in the hopes that it will resonate uh, with all of you, mainly because all of us care about health. So my topic is uh, how we innovate and how we think about innovation in health in an era of health care reform. At least we're all thinking about health these days, right? Um, but, but before I get started, I, I wanted to start by uh, addressing, um, in fact, the, the very introduction that, that Warren just gave me for this talk. And, and let me just start with a, a picture that uh, many of you may have been to this place before. Um, this is actually Sugar Bowl. Um, and and the, the really good looking guy in this photo is my husband, Nick Hellman, uh, who is very helpfully pointing out for Warren with his ski pole. Warren didn't know I was showing this picture, by the way. <laughs> He's pointing out with his ski pole, there's, a, in fact, a typo up at Sugar Bowl. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and if any of you have been there, you'll know, as I do, that there's an N missing from Helm and Shoot, it turns out. So um, we'll be back up this winter, Warren, and, <laughs> and, and duly noted. So this is Nick Hellman. And, and, but I did want to set the record straight before, let, before we talk about health. I, I want to set the record straight. And my husband, Nick, is, in fact, um, from Kentucky. And uh, in, in Kentucky, the, the Hellmans are far more known as being a condiment um, than being known for high finance. <laughs> So, in, in matter of fact, I do have evidence, Warren, that the real, and you can see the real way to spell Hellman is on this jar. <laughs> okay, now healthcare. It's so funny you introduced me that way. I didn't know that you would. Um, okay, so, so let's talk healthcare. As, as you've just heard, I've spent my entire professional life thinking about health and health care. So I'm a physician, I'm a cancer doctor, an oncologist. And my journey has always been one where no matter what I've done, I have an incredible passion for making life better for people who are patients, who are suffering or ill. And so as I started to hear about health care reform and the health care debate, as an optimist, I was really excited. I was very, very excited to think okay, new president, energy, high polls, things are going to change. We're going to improve health care in America. I'm, I'm assuming many of you were as well. This slide shows some of the, the headlines that we all saw over the summer. Healthcare rationing, death panels, the public option. Is that socialism? What does the public option mean? The president's meetings were beset by angry mobs. There were gun-toting protesters in town halls. So what had become, for me, a, an opportunity to think about something that I personally care about deeply, whether it was my background as a community oncologist in drug development, in pharmaceutical business, or in biotech, or now as chancellor at University of California, San Francisco, I want health care. I want health to be better. So when I see someone like uh, Senator Specter with the guy, that, that guy looks really scary to me, pointing at him, there, there are a couple observations that I would make about the health care debate, um, one most important to me. But at the outset, the observation I would make is that much of the debate hasn't actually been about health. It's been about insurance. And I think today, if you look at healthcare reform has become insurance reform. Now, many people think insurance for health does need reform, so I'm not criticizing an effort to reform health insurance, but I think we should be realistic about what's missing from a discussion about health insurance reform is discussion about things that I care about a lot that have to do with health. Access. Thank you. <laughs> I'd love for us to talk more about access. Does everyone who needs health care receive health care? I'd love for us to talk about incentives. Why is health delivered in America the way it is? What are the incentives that drive health to be delivered the way that it is in America or treatment to be the way delivered? But what I want to talk to you about this afternoon, because I don't consider myself an expert on either access or incentives, I want to talk to you about something that I think has been completely missing from the healthcare reform debate that I have a great passion for, and that is innovation. We haven't had any discussion in the debate about healthcare reform about innovation. And I find that so striking and, and, in fact, shocking that innovation hasn't been part of the debate on healthcare reform. Many people have asked me. What's it been like moving from Genentech to University of California, San Francisco? Well, that's a pretty big change, going from biotechnology back to academia. And I tell people lots of differences, very, very different to work at UCSF as compared to my 14 years working at Genentech. 
but there are a couple things that the two places have in common. One is exceptional talent, unbelievable talent, the kind that I always hope will make me have to elevate my game, that I'm going to have to read more, study harder, think more, because the people around me are so amazing. And that is true at UCSF in a spectacular way. The other thing is this incredible quest to innovate, this drive to make things better. And so what I want to talk to you about this afternoon in my comments is how I think about innovation. And I want to tell a story about innovation because I want the story to help me to illustrate how I think we can do better on innovation and maybe introduce as part of the healthcare debate, are there ways that we can use innovation, doing things better to improve health in the United States and worldwide? So I like this quote. This is a quote from uh, Theodore Levitt, who was professor at Harvard Business School and, the, and for a while the editor of the Harvard Business Review. And, and he said, um, creativity is thinking up new things. Innovation is doing new things. And I like this quote because this is how I think about innovation, and this is how I think about the kind of science I love best, and that is translational science. So I'm not a basic scientist. I'm not the kind of scientist who goes in the lab with test tubes and mixes things together or, or thinks about animals or petri dishes. I'm a clinical scientist. Uh, I like to tell people my favorite animal stands upright and walks on two legs, all of us. <laughs> so what is a clinical scientist anyway? How, how does a clinical scientist operate? And what does a clinical scientist or a physician scientist do? Well, a clinical scientist at their best takes creativity, takes discoveries, and makes them into new things. As head of product development, I spent 14 years thinking every day about how to take the discoveries that came out of the labs at Genentech. How could we take those discoveries and make them into new things that would help patients? That's a really great job. But it's also a very, very challenging job because the area of translational science, clinical science, is actually not very good. It's not done as well as it should be. It's not done as well as it could be. And so I'll tell you a story that is a story about making a cancer drug by blocking blood vessels. And I'm going to use this story to tell you how I think we should think about what we do well in healthcare and innovation and where we might do some things better. And it's a little bit of a story on myself, so I don't mind being critical because this whole development program was done while I was at Genentech. So I, I, it is lunch, and I tried to find only pictures. <laughs> if anyone feels like a little woozy seeing this much blood vessel action after lunch. Um, so this is a cartoon that shows um, uh, the concept of using antiangiogenesis for cancer, and it's not hard. This is a pretty simple concept. So this is an open blood vessel. These are red blood cells tracking down the blood vessel, this is a tumor. Looks pretty bad, doesn't it? That's a tumor. And these are signals that the tumor is sending out saying, I'm growing over here. I need some new blood vessels because I'm going to grow and spread by using those new blood vessels. So this concept that a tumor cannot grow, in fact, a tumor can't grow beyond two millimeters, the size of a BB, without new blood vessels. And it can't spread. It can't metastasize or spread without new blood vessels. This is the concept behind the phenomenon of blocking blood vessel growth to treat cancer. It's that simple. The tumor produces its own growth factors. They cause these blood vessels to form, and the tumor grows and spreads. That seems like something we ought to be able to intervene on, right? That's the concept of anti angiogenesis said, if a tumor can't grow and it can't spread, it can't cause you harm. It can't hurt you, make you suffer, or kill you, so why don't we stop the cancer in its tracks? Well, 
that's a good story. That's a good science story. And a person like me, a clinical translational scientist, wants to ask, how could we use that phenomenon? How could we use that and tap into that to help patients? So let me tell you a little bit more about the timing of this story. And the timing of this story actually goes back to 1971. That's remarkable that I'm telling you this story in 2009, and the story started in 1971. In 1971, in the New England Journal of Medicine, very important scientific journal, the publication by Judah Folkman appeared speculating that, in fact, tumor cells grow, divide, spread, tumors get worse because of angiogenesis. And if one could block that, we could treat cancer. 1971. I came to Genentech in 1995, having gone to cancer meetings every year and often seeing, by that time, who we would call poor Judah, come and tell the story about anti-angiogenesis and how he believed that we could treat tumor cells through this anti-angiogenesis. And poor Judah, because at some point when you tell that story from 1971, people say, oh, he's telling that story again. And it was like that. So in 1995, when I came to Genentech, the, there was a discovery that had been made by a scientist, Napoleon Ferrara, from UCSF, who had moved from, he, he's an Italian gynecologist, and he had moved from UCSF to Genentech, and in 1989, he identified a protein called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. It's a growth factor that tells new blood vessels to form. So it helps grow new blood vessels. And we had an antibody, something that was a weapon targeted to this VEGF that could block the VEGF. It acts basically like a sponge, makes the levels go down, and blocks that angiogenic factor. So, in 1997, with great trepidation, because we felt like we were going into uncharted territory, we started the first clinical trials ever. The first human beings ever were treated with anti-VEGF, this antibody to block that blood vessel factor. So I'll tell you, one of the things you don't hear about when you hear about drug development or product development is what it's like to do things for the very first time. One of the other clinical scientists at Genentech, Dr. Gwen Fife and I, had a completely sleepless night. The first day, the first patient was ever treated with anti-VEGF. And we would run into each other in the hall and we'd say, it's good to have blood vessels. We like having blood vessels. What's gonna happen? Will we be able to successfully treat someone and not harm the normal blood vessels and get in the way of the cancer. So I can tell you, we were terrified. We were really afraid about side effects, and, and even though we believe the theory, the hypothesis, this was brand new, very innovative, but we weren't quite sure that we had all the answers. In fact, we were sure we didn't have all the answers. But take a look at this timing, 1971 to 1997. So one of the things I was sure of is this had taken an awfully long time, and patients were waiting. And I felt and feel a sense of urgency. Patients are waiting. We need to do something. Everyone is always irritated about how long it takes to make a new medicine. So we said, well, let's try and go quickly. Let's try and go very fast into trials in patients who actually have advanced cancer to see if we can help. So we went quickly into advanced breast cancer, hoping we could block these blood vessels and make the breast cancer better. There's probably a few chronicle readers in the crowd. Genentech drug fails key test. Well, it turned out, and it turns out, that our attempt to go quickly in patients who were very, very sick from breast cancer was probably too late for those patients. So that's the other thing I wanted to tell you about innovation in medicine. You're always balancing speed with carefulness. And I would do it the same way again. If we could have helped these patients, it would have been wonderful. But the first trial, in fact, failed because we didn't yet know, but we discovered that was probably too late for patients. I'm quoted here saying, 
you know, I know everyone's upset, <laughs> but we still have other clinical trials. So one of the first things I would tell you about innovation where we need to do better is we don't know enough about when trials fail, why they fail, and how we can do better. But the hypothesis was, our theory was, if we treat earlier, we will do better. And in fact, I wouldn't tell this story if it didn't have a good ending. <laughs> so the good news, the happy news, is that in 2004, the very first medicine ever using anti-angiogenesis to treat cancer was approved in the United States, and that's Avastin, anti-VEGF, that antibody, for colon cancer. Two years later, approved for lung cancer, then breast cancer, and this year for kidney and brain cancer. So that 1971 article in the New England Journal was in fact true. We could successfully slow down cancers and block their growth and spread using anti-angiogenesis. So the really good news, unfortunately Dr. Folkman passed away last year, but he lived to see that in fact his theory was not only true, but look at what a difference his theory could make for patients with five different very tough tumor types to treat. The story is continuing. There's efforts to bring this medicine, anti-VEGF, earlier in the course of treatment for cancer, and this is very tough to do. Still, lots of questions, very challenging. But I want to challenge, why did it take us so long? 1971 to 2004 for the first human approval. And more important than that, why did it take us so long to get into the clinic? And I thought, well, maybe, you know, since I was involved in this story, maybe we just weren't particularly fast enough. So I looked, you know, two weeks ago at UCSF, I was so happy because one of our own, Liz Blackburn, won the Nobel Prize. Awesome. <laughs> And hearing Liz talk about how curiosity drove her to figure out how chromosomes stop dividing, really the basic way that cells decide to keep growing, keep dividing, or become senescent, telomeres and telomerase. So Christmas 1984, telomerase was identified. That's what won the Nobel Prize for Liz and her colleagues. I looked it up. The first clinical trial in cancer targeting telomerase, the trial initiated in 2005, 21 years later. So what I want to challenge is, how could we do better? How could we talk about innovation so it's not 1971 to 2004 for that whole period of time, so it's not 1984 for a brilliant discovery and 2005 before we ever get in the clinic. How could we do better at clinical science, at translational science, moving from that curiosity, that discovery, to the true innovation when it actually gets to human beings? So let me share with you three things, because you don't get 10 things for a lunchtime talk. <laughs> and I know you got to go back to work. Three things that I would put forward as ideas, concepts, that I would like to see us use more effectively to bridge that gap between discovery and realizing what's possible for patients. I don't have all the answers, but I have three ideas. So the first idea is the concept of reverse translation. So remember I talked about my favorite animal? Well, it turns out that lab mice are where we find out a lot of what we know about biology. We know about this blocking blood vessels largely because of mice. And there's something that you all may have read about that's very, very, very popular in mice, and that's using knockout mice or knockdown mice. And that just means that you knock out a gene or you knock down a gene so you know what that gene does. It's pretty simple. If you said, what does VEGF do, this protein that grows blood vessels, in a mouse, you can genetically alter the mouse so that it has no VEGF or it has much less VEGF. And these studies are widely published, very famous, very important science studies. Well, as a clinical scientist, I want to go back to something. More than 500,000 patients have been treated with a precise antibody that blocks VEGF. I would far rather know 
exactly what happened in those 500,000 patients than 5 million mice. Why don't we know exactly what happened in those 500,000 patients? Well, we don't know because we don't have electronic medical records, and we don't track, and we don't sort out, and we don't follow all those patients who have ever been treated. So my first, not, you know, this isn't rocket science. My first idea is we should know. We should know every time someone's treated with a medicine, particularly such a precise medicine as this anti-VEGF, we should know exactly what happens. And the reverse translation part of this is, if it gives us ideas, then we can go back to the mice or the Petri dish or the test tube and learn more about that. But let's start by seeing and observing and paying attention deeply to what happens in human beings. That's my first idea. So the really good news is electronic medical records matter for a number of reasons. And so we could go along for the ride if there's electronic medical records. We could help with this. The second idea is improved translation of discoveries. And this is UCSF scientist Joe DeRisi, who's an expert on doing arrays, on understanding deeply the entire genome of organisms like malaria. So we now have incredible tools to understand exactly the genetics of malaria parasites, of cancer cells. Again, we've got experience in patients. We should know every time a patient has a cancer, exactly what's the zip code of that cancer, exactly what the genetics are. And we ought to do that broadly, and we ought to leverage that so that when we link that to the patient's outcomes, we will know how the DNA of all the cancers and the patient's outcome are related. We need to have this personalized medicine. Now, many of you have heard me talk about Herceptin and HER2 and how we personalize Herceptin. One of the things that's hard about this anti-VEGF is we don't know which tumors have a lot of VEGF, which tumors are driven by VEGF, and which tumors aren't. So we have to guess, literally, which patients might benefit from this. If we had a biomarker, this genetic zip code for every cancer, we might have done a better job of translating the discovery into only those patients who have VEGF-driven tumors. Not a novel idea, but we need to do that better and more deeply. Understand what's driving the cancer and then treat that. Here's my third idea more effective clinical trials. I didn't get into the details of the trials, but you can tell from these timelines, these trials can take two years, three years, five years, 10 years. Well, why do they take so long? Literally, we do an x-ray every three weeks, every six weeks, every three months. And if you're following a patient every three months or every six months, or if your endpoint is how long that patient lives, you hope that patient lives a long time, that means the trial lasts a long time. So we need what are called surrogate markers, better markers that tell us short term, how's that patient doing in an hour, in a week, in a month? So we can quickly switch gears. This is just a picture of a PET scan. One of the ways that you can, this is a, a tumor that's at the base of the tongue. You guys can see, you don't need to be a radiologist to see this, right? What if you had a way to use a PET scan or other markers to say, look, I treated with this new medicine, and this bright light of the cancer didn't turn down. We'll give that patient a different medicine. Switch gears, and switch gears promptly after you do the x-ray. So this is a lot better than waiting several months until the tumor shrinks. So we need to discover, we need the translational science to bring us better imaging. Can we dial up or dial down certain things that tell us, good job, you did what you were supposed to do, or not, not even close. You didn't touch that. And you can quickly switch gears or know who are the patients who seem to be benefiting from your therapy. So my third point on translational science is we need to be much better at this ability to dial up and dial down the ways that we make cancer better or not. So I propose these three ideas not because I think that's all the answers, but one of the reasons I moved to come back to UCSF is the incredible passion I have for translational science. 
The very, very good news is I think in Northern California at UCSF here, we have all the talent, all the tools, the best science in the world, I'm sure of that. We ought to be the best in the world at translational science. If we could crack the nut on some of the issues I just talked about at UCSF, and I'm very convinced we will be the best in the world at translational science, think of how all those discoveries, all those inventions, all that creativity could completely transform how we think about innovation in healthcare. That's why I came to UCSF, and stay tuned. You'll hear more about that in the future. So my last slide is, is meant to be dreamy, because I think that's what you should do if you really love science and medicine and you love the, the concept of making things better. So I, I led off with a slide of some of the headlines that we were seeing about healthcare reform. So why not make up headlines that I'd like to see? <laughs> This is, this is a, a, a pictorial of the, the new hospital that we'll be building uh, in Mission Bay, uh, the UCSF Medical Center. And here's some of the headlines I'd like to see. Alzheimer's preventative found. Cancer cure discovered. Obesity rates dramatically decline. Innovative models speed science to improved health. Why not these? Let's think big, you know? <laughs> The good news is I don't think that's so dreamy. I think we ought to challenge ourselves to say, what are the things we're going to do to make this possible, to make this happy, happen, because I'll be happy. The, so, so the other thing, and I hesitate to even suggest this, but remember where we started, health care reform, the debate about health care reform. Why can't we use innovation to have this headline? Healthcare costs decline. That's what we should really challenge ourselves to do. <laughs> and again, I don't think that's so audacious. If we're more efficient, if it doesn't take us from 1971 to 2004, surely we'll improve the way that we can discover, develop, and deliver healthcare and, and truly improve health here again, both in America and globally. So I'm gonna end my comments there and I hope I left at least a little time for questions. Thank you so much for listening. Oh, did I, did I mention the quiz about the cartoon on VEGF? That passed out the quiz sheets. <laughs> Uh, my wife and I have. Oh. Okay, Warren says we can do at least one question. <laughs> Time for oh, one. He has okay. a question. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. My, my wife and I have a special needs son who's 21 years old. At age eight, we took him to UCSF, had genetic testing done, and discovered that he had a chromosome 22Q deletion, which resulted in a diagnosis of velocardiofacial syndrome. Do you envision a day where we can, through genetic engineering, go into an adult, a young adult, and create that strand or recreate a chromosome 22Q deletion by adding that strand back or diagnosing, uh, maybe not diagnosing, but re-engineering this type of condition? I don't know if that makes sense, what I'm saying. No, I, it, it makes sense. I'm trying to figure out if it's possible. So it, it, what the kind of thing you're talking about, here's what I would worry about. I think you would have to start knowing that in utero to really make an impact, first of all. And secondly, what you're talking about is a genetic engineering challenge that is amazingly daunting. Um, so I can't sit here and think of exactly how you would do that, particularly at age eight as we sit here today. But it is remarkable what is possible because most of the things that we're doing now I didn't learn in medical school. So I would never say never. You'd have to back that up quite a bit and it would be quite a feat of genetic engineering. Um, I would think that today you would think much more of something like a stem cell transplant to sort of replace all the cells early on with something else. Um, but it, good question. I, I, I think it would be tough to do what you're suggesting. 
<laughs> but I never say never. Warren has a question. I got nothing. You got nothing? <laughs> okay. I need to let you. You need to stay up here. Oh, I need to stay up here? You have to stay up oh, here. Okay. Well, we're gonna, you know. We're going to debate the, the one and two N. <laughs> You win. I checked our family history. We actually started with two ends. So. <laughs> so if you play in a band, there's a rule that you never want to fa follow a kid's act. Well, I have a new rule. Never follow Susan Desmond Hellman, uh, which it's my pleasure to do. That was a phenomenal speech. Well, on behalf of all of us, we would like to present, can anybody hear me? Does anybody want to? Yes. We would like to present you with this gift, token of our appreciation for the work that you've done, but the work you're going to do. And if you continue your work, this exact audience is going to be sitting here 50 years from now, so <laughs> keep it up. <laughs>